All right, man, welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I got a bit of a cold. Um, anyhow, I shot the eclipse yesterday, and uh, I may sound a little funny because I, I'm suction on one of those lozenges. Um, but let's, let's open up here with a thing that I saw that was pretty amazing across the street. Um, I'll never be a wildlife photographer. <laughs> I forgot to turn on my, my uh, telephoto stabilizer. But there was this mother hen turkey, if that's what you call them, and uh, first I noticed a few babies and the longer I watched, I counted more and more and more chicks. There were at least 10 chicks here. I've never seen that many chicks. I don't know if they share mothering responsibilities, but anyhow, let's get into the eclipse here. <clears throat> Roughly four hours before the, the eclipse was going to begin, uh, jets started to spray trails across the ecliptic. And that's what you're looking at here. This is prior to. I took out my regular camera, my Nikon, <clears throat> put a telephoto on it with a doubler, put a standard solar filter on it, and I started looking at this, and I didn't think I was going to be able to film. Uh, I had trouble focusing. I couldn't get a good image at all. As time went on, uh, I came in, I posted, um, I was doing some stuff online, and I started to think, wait a minute, this is later in the day. Uh, maybe I can take the solar telescope with the full spectrum camera, which is the rig you're looking at here, and peer through the debris that's being sprayed over the ecliptic, and it worked. So with the one camera, I got the entirety of the eclipse. With the other camera, and I'll run both sets of footage, I only got some of it before chemtrails made it impossible for a standard camera to work. I got reports from all over the country. Uh, that people are getting sprayed. I'll include some images later. A uh, person down the coast below Washington, D.C., good friend of mine sent an image. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that later. But this is what happens. After the chemtrailing, the sky starts to smudge out like this. It becomes very difficult to focus uh, cameras and telescopes under these conditions. You can see there, there's three lines straight over the ecliptic. But look in the center frame there. If I had to guess, I'm wondering if that's a drone I caught. Um, this is out of a video clip, so it's a little blurry. But there's something there, center frame. <clears throat> so this is the Canon full-spectrum camera put on a hydrogen alpha telescope. And it peered beautifully through the debris that was sprayed uh, over the ecliptic all day long. Well, mostly, you'll see. In a second here, I'll show you the footage from the Nikon, which has basically a 800 millimeter uh, long throw telephoto with a doubler on it. That's this footage. And as you can see, the debris is blowing by. But for a long time, it held its own. What I'm going to do here is run the entirety of both cameras at 3,000% speed so we can see the whole thing. And uh, as time goes on, I will get through more footage and maybe do something more with this footage. As you can see here, uh, I'm letting everyone know that this was shot through the t solar telescope, which has a diagonal, which is a prism, which means this image is flipped. And I'm not going to manipulate it or unflip it. I'm showing it as it was shot. <clears throat> Again, this is at 3,000% speed. I'm still taking stills out of the video and other stills that I shot to see if I can detect any transparency to the object problem here is there was so much debris in the air um, that ISO settings and other things were jacked up so far that the imagery is not nearly the quality it could have been. But I will say this, there's no possible way I could have shot the full eclipse without a full spectrum camera. I wasn't sure, you know, if I just used the full spectrum camera, um, not going through the H-alpha scope, um, I knew it would work, but going through the H alpha scope, I wasn't sure because it basically knocks down 99 point something percent of the light and then only lets the hydrogen alpha waves through. Um, but as you can see here, excuse me, <clears throat> you know, you can see the debris blowing by and it's a pretty sharp shot the whole time. So this is tracking on my scope. When we get to the footage to the other camera, uh, I am not tracking and you'll notice that when it's speeded up. There were a number of things about the eclipse yesterday, and uh, while I probably won't cover them here, Jason and I are going to run the next show. Uh, we're recording Tuesday, or Wednesday, it'll go live Thursday. It's going to be about eclipses. So many things to cover. Um, the transparency of the disk, what's actually causing the occultation here. Um, about the shadow, you know, it's funny. 
I worked years as a stagehand, and a good part of that uh, was working with lighting people, designers, directors, uh, people refurbishing lights, and I learned a lot about lighting uh, from these people. Now, back when I was in San Diego, I had started to think about this, but I got so busy it fell by the wayside. As they began to report for this eclipse and give, you know, supposedly 70 mile wide shadow paths, I began to think about this again. Jason and I are going to cover this really in detail in the upcoming episode um, because it began to dawn on me if we can identify the type of light source the sun is, we can identify things about the shadow. As an example, whenever you look at the NASA kind of orbital model uh, that shows an eclipse happening, you're shown the moon making a cone-shaped uh, shadow, and that's always bothered me, so I went at it, and it's nonsense, and uh, we'll get into why it's nonsense. Different lighting sources, like as an example, a spotlight, if you take an object and put a spotlight on it, what happens when you move the spotlight closer is the shadow grows larger. Um, this is not true of all types of light source. Uh, people can look into infinite light source, which we're told that's what type of light the sun is. And again, I'll explain this better. But here we are, probably well past half of the eclipse. Um, I'm taking stills out of some of this and trying to manipulate them in Photoshop to see if I can detect anything. Notice up at the point, top point of the moon, there are a couple of, or the sun, there are a couple of tiny prominences there. Um, that's all we saw all day long, and this is a solar scope, so if there were any prominences to be filmed, I should have picked them up, and now you can see they're just about gone up at the top there. There were a couple tiny sunspots, but, uh, you know, it's a funny thing too. When I first got the solar telescope, there was a ton of surface details, filaments, all kinds of stuff going on on the surface of the sun. Um, later, as time went on, the uh, sun began to just lose all detail, which is where we are now. We're told by NASA and other space agencies that there's an 11-year sun cycle and that there's this whole thing called the solar minimum. But, you know, I'll be looking into this. I will mention, a lot of people are under the impression that when they used to look at the sun, it was a lot more yellow than it is now. They claim that what they see now is much more white. It's hard to know how much of this is memory, playing tricks on people, people remembering things they wanted to, but the point I would make here is it's been a ton of people that have said this to me. All right, here we come down to the end of the eclipse with the full spectrum camera on the hydrogen alpha telescope. And as you can see now, the chemtrails are so bad uh, that I almost can't peer through it with a full spectrum camera. Um, ironic thing, my memory card filled up about five seconds after completion here. All right, now we're gonna move on to the Nikon camera. 36 megapixels, uh, big honking telephoto lens on it. We're not tracking here as you can see, and you can see the problems that go on um, Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> it looks like I got a couple I, I, I got a couple clips backwards there. Anyhow, this is the eclipse proper. You'll see how the chemtrails build up and up and up as this goes on. And finally, I can't get the total eclipse with this rig. I wanted to shoot with this because there's more megapixels and you can really, really get a sharp image. Problem here was with so much debris in the air, it was very difficult to focus. Um, and you can kind of tell this because there are a couple sunspots which running at 3,000% like this makes it difficult to detect them, but they're there. But I thought these might be good still images, and I did click a number of stills um, to manipulate and see if I could see any transparency to the disk that is occulting the sun. Here come the chemtrails. Just look at that. So bad. Um, we got a little reprieve here, but it picks up again. There's only two more clips here, three more clips here that are going to run before I have to turn off this camera. So I got reports from all over the country that people were clouded out and that spraying was going on. One of my friends that's south of Washington, D.C. sent me an image that I'm going to show you here. They always get horrible, horrible spraying from jets. And that image is about to load. I have to shut this camera off now because it just gets so bad I can't. So this is from south of D.C. Um, you can see what's going on there. They couldn't even film. This is back up in Rhode Island where I am. This is why I had to shut off the camera we were just looking at. This is a full spectrum still. Uh, I temporarily shut down and took a couple stills to show. You can see the lines in the sky. 
there's some real irony here. Um, they started spraying across the ecliptic roughly four hours before the eclipse began. Within 45 minutes, under an hour of completion of the eclipse, we had pure blue skies. So anyhow, there it is, the eclipse of 2017, and Jason and I will have a hell of a lot to say about eclipses on this coming show, which we'll post this Thursday after the eclipse. Anyhow, there it is, man. Cheers.